All right, you can turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to talk today about Paul, the Apostle Paul, his changed life gospel. The gospel that we are supposed to be preaching produces a changed life. Lordship salvation, okay, to define the terms here because people are going to put that on me because they're liars, okay? Lordship salvation is you change your life before you get saved. Jesus has to become the Lord of your life. There's not any ability to sin. You become sinlessly perfect, and then God grants you salvation. That's Calvinism, right? Hyper-Calvinism, right? That's not the gospel, okay? That is a false gospel. But then the other side, the flip side of the coin is easy believism, where you say, I don't have to have any conviction of sin. I don't have to have any kind of changed life, any turning from sin after salvation. You just simply have a belief. And these wicked perverts will come out, and they will go through the scriptures, and they will say, I got to find somebody that's that's living in sin and yet still is said to be saved because then I can justify my own sins. They're wicked. Incredibly incredibly wicked. But I'm going to show you here today in this study the proof that there's a changed life. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 15 and 16 here it says for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ yet have ye not many fathers for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Who is our example as Christians, Bible-believing Christians? The Apostle Paul. Not Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Not some place back in Revelation or whatever. Paul is our example. Paul was the one who's preaching to both Jews and Gentiles. Peter did a little bit as well. But the gospel of the uncircumcision is committed to Paul. That's very under, important to understand. And I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist that says you should never read anything in the Gospels or whatever else. But I'll tell you right now, if you're just going and, you know, I get these stupid little heretic weenies, you know, these little whatevers, and, and they come out, I read the words of Jesus, I don't read the words of Paul. Well, then you're lost. Okay? You're lost. Because the Lord Jesus Christ chose Paul to be the apostle of our salvation. To be the one that would come out and tell us what it means to be saved. And he says we're supposed to follow his example. I'm going to show you about this. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So see, Paul doesn't say, forget Jesus Christ. You don't need to follow him. You don't ever read anything in the Gospels. He's not saying that. First Corinthians or uh, First Timothy chapter six talks about the thing of you know that we're to consent to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're supposed to go back to the Gospels and read those things, but our salvation comes after Jesus Christ died on the cross, not before. So people go back. Most of the Gospels are written doctrinally in the Old Testament. Again, read Hebrews chapter nine. Hebrews chapter nine, verse fifteen through seventeen, talks about the Testament coming in, the New Testament coming in after the death of the testator. So you get people going back, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, well, there's our salvation. Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. How could you be saved from some place of Scripture that's recording events that happened before Jesus died on the cross? See? They'll go back to Acts chapter 2. You say, well, Jesus is dead on the cross. He's buried and he rose again, Acts chapter 1. Sure, but the gospel wasn't fully revealed yet. All right? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they're baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's not the mode of salvation today. That's why Paul writes over and over again about my gospel. It's the gospel was committed to Paul. That's where it comes from. So if the gospel is committed to Paul, then we should look at Paul's life and say, okay, I can see things there. Now, obviously, you don't have to be a tent-making Pharisee, you know, to be saved or something. Well, of course not. But you look at the mode of his salvation, what happened. Let's check about that. Acts chapter 9. Let's read the actual account of what happened here. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And Paul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, of course, this is a special revelation given just to Paul. You don't have to go from you know, the road to Damascus and God knocks you down with a light and stuff and you go blind. No, no, no. 
This is a special revelation that God gave to Paul. But we're going to see what part of Paul's life we're supposed to uh, follow. He said, be followers of me. Verse 4, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let me go back up to verse 5 there. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What's the, what does that mean? Paul was trying to establish his own righteousness. He was going and he was persecuting people. Christians is what he was persecuting. There's people that were saved there, you know, and they are saved. They're part of the same body of Christ, okay? But the gospel's not fully revealed until Paul. It doesn't mean that people had to get re-saved or something like that. It's just the Lord, the book of Acts is a transition book. It's very important to understand that. But you see there, when you are trying to establish your own righteousness, your own self-righteousness, it's hard. It's very difficult, you know? I mean, you're just always just banging your head against the wall kind of a deal, trying to save yourself. It doesn't work. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, or, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this kind of was a little... Um, interesting analogy here uh, or not maybe not an analogy but when you really truly get to that point of salvation you'll see this thing of there's always going to be some kind of a you're really concerned and you're just like I really don't feel like eating you lose your appetite a lot of times and you're just like I need to know I'm, that I'm saved I need to know I'm a sinner I don't want to go to hell when I die there's a change that happens verse 10 and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him uh, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Now here's the big point. This is what you need to get from this study. Okay, this is the big one. Verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Wait a second here. The Lord must be confused. You see, because all that's necessary for salvation is just a profession of faith. Just belief. You see? You see how it falls apart when you actually read what the Bible says? These heretics that are out there saying, it's just a profession of faith, it's just belief. What do you do with that passage there? First of all, you have Ananias and he's going, you, what, you want me to go talk to who? Saul of Tarsus? Do you realize how bad a man this guy is? And the Lord says, yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to show him what things he's going to do for my sake after he gets saved. Sounds like a changed life to me. Let me just put it into modern day terms, okay? Um, trying to think of somebody in, in modern day times that kills Christians. You know, that's notorious for killing Christians. We'll just say the, the head of, uh, okay, we'll say the Black Pope. There's a good one, you know. The Black Pope, and he's stuck someplace. You know, he's he's over in uh, the up here above us, the Aristic Aristic uh, Center Mall. It was a big shopping mall. It's emptying out, you know, because of the economy falling apart. But <laughs> he's he's sitting up there. He's in one of the stores, and he went blind. None of his advisors know what to do for him. And the Lord says to me, "Hey, I want you to go talk to the guy up there, the Black Pope." And I go. You want me to go talk to the Black Pope? Lord says, yeah. He's a chosen vessel. I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Would that be a little bit of a leap of faith for me? Yeah. Yeah. You see? It would require a changed life. 
you understand where I'm going with this thing? Paul is persecuting Christians. And so when a Christian hears, go talk to Saul, he was called Saul at the time, go talk to Saul of Tarsus, he's going, whoa, wait a second here. He doesn't go, oh, cool, did he believe? Oh, that's great, praise the Lord. He's going, Saul of Tarsus? Do you realize what he's doing to the Christians, Lord? Do you, do you understand? And the Lord doesn't say, that's not a problem, he believes in me. He, he, he has a profession of faith. You see, Saul could come out and have a profession of faith to deceive the people so he can get them into jail. If you walked up to the black pope and said, are you a Christian? What do you think he'd say? I'm actually an arch Satanist that worships Lucifer. Of course not. He would say, me a Christian? Well, of course I'm a Christian. You'd say, well, Mr. Black Pope there, uh, uh, do you believe in Jesus? Well, of course I believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross. You say, well, then that's enough for me. He has a profession of faith. You'd be insane to think a thing like that. Right? You walk up to any Jesuit, you walk up to a Catholic priest, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins? Well, of course, yes. Well, then come on into our house church here. Come on in, you're welcome. You want to stand up and give the sermon this morning? Praise the Lord, he believes in Jesus. <laughs> no, no, there's a changed life that accompanies true salvation. Just incredible. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Okay, Just if you've seen my thing about the, what happens to him, uh, new Christian, what happens when you get newly saved or whatever. There's a tie in, a great tie in here with John chapter 9, the man receiving his sight. Pretty neat. <clears throat> Verse 19, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Huh? You mean there was a change? And the easy believers and people go, well, you, you, there was, but it doesn't have to be there. You see, but at this time, you couldn't trust people back then. Somebody come along and say, I'm a Christian. We're going to see this in a little bit. I'm a Christian. Yeah, oh, sure, I'm a Christian. They would test the person. They would say, well, wh okay, what do you mean by that? You know, they wouldn't just go, oh, praise the Lord. He believes he's a Christian. You know, there needs to be some proof. Verse 21, notice this. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. You know, when your life changes, it will confound the lost people that knew you in the past. My best friend growing up, Keith Ekman was his name. And I told him the one time, I, he, I hadn't talked to him in a long time, and he calls me up. I'd gotten saved, and I said, he's like, so what are you doing with your time? I said, I'm studying the Bible. And he laughed because he couldn't believe it. It confounded him. And I said, I'm being serious. I'm not joking. He couldn't believe that the guy he used to know would actually spend his time studying the Bible. But here I am. Changed life. Oh, and he's a professing Christian too, by the way just as I was once a professing Christian. But the people that know me now, that knew me back when, way back when, they know that I've changed. Same thing will apply to you if you're saved. Verse 23, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Mm -hmm. Another good sign of being truly converted. People want to kill you. <laughs> How many can say amen to that? Yeah, go ahead. Verse 24, but their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. He had a profession of faith, didn't he? Isn't that enough? But look what happens. 
But Paul walked in and said, I believe by faith. That's enough. You people that are here telling me I have to have a changed life, you're preaching lordship salvation, you're the ones that aren't truly saved. Oh, wait a second, it doesn't say that. I seem to have a problem, just, you know. Yeah. Let's actually look what it says. Verse 27, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the, to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. So they wanted to kill him too. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had all the churches, or then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee, or Galilee, excuse me, and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So you get a Christian Barnabas coming in, and he goes, "Okay, everybody, just you know, calm yourself down. I'm standing here. This is Paul. Come on in, Paul." And he stands there, hi, and everybody goes, oh, you know, you know, looking outside probably for the soldiers going. Okay, this is an ambush. It has to be, you know. This can't be the same guy. And he says, look, let me tell you about some of the stuff that this guy's been doing. Oh, and if that's not enough, Brother Paul, you want to go out and do some preaching? And so Paul goes out and preaches the word. And all of a sudden they're going, this guy is saved. Wow. You know, there's a lot of people that get here on YouTube and they say, I'm a Christian. I believe the King James Bible from cover to cover and everything else. And then they get mad and you hear them using profanity. And then they cover it up. They won't repent of that. And then you hear them saying things that are Roman Catholic. Then you hear their profession of faith. Well, I got, sa I got saved as a young child in Sunday school while at the Catholic Church. I got saved when I was a little tiny boy and my mother raised me to be a Baptist and I'll be a Baptist all my life. And that's your profession of faith. Where's the change in your life? That's required. Why? Paul is our example. And you know what? Christians had better start to be a bit more careful about who they accept into their groups. Somebody comes along, I'm a Christian. Those are nice children that you have. Oh, okay, you can go on and take them off the nursery there, you know, in the Babel building or something. Or, oh, yeah, you can take them into another room there if you're hopefully not going to Babel buildings anymore as they are proved to be the wicked places that they are. But, yeah, go ahead. You take my kids and go out of my sight and things like this because you're a professing Christian. No, you need to have some more brains than that. And somebody comes along and they say, I'm a Christian. You say, oh, okay, so is the Pope. <laughs> um... What do you mean, is it, are you a Christian? Talk to him a little bit. I heard the story the one time of a uh, house church. I forget what country it was, but it was an actual house church, the real, doing it the biblical way. It was in another country. It wasn't here in America. Um, people are still holding on to the idols of their church buildings. If, if, you know, if the body of Christ would actually organize and, and things, and people that have more intelligence than I do would actually get together, put their heads together and say, you know what, let's get back to doing things the Bible way, the New Testament way. Let's take some of our older men and go around and establish groups of people, churches, you know, people. Go out and establish churches and, and put elders and things in those different cities and things to, to maintain rule and proper doctrine and things like that. Um, we'd get a lot further ahead, but uh, of course people don't want to do that because it's, then we look kooky and stuff to the world. And you don't want to look like an outsider or a weirdo or something like this because you have to have a church building to look respectable. <laughs> yeah, respectable to the Catholics. But, you know, this story was that there was a guy who went over to this country. I forget where it was. It might have even been an Islamic country. And they, uh, he found out that there was a house church meeting in the area. And he met one of the elders of the house church. They had multiple elders, not just the one-man pastor that everybody worships. And uh, he went to one of these elders and he said, I'd like to come visit your house church. And he said, okay, uh, we're going to need to talk to you. And so he went and he met with the elders all the elders got together and they met and they asked him questions and they, they tested to see, okay, is this guy a real Christian? And he was. And so they said, okay, here's where we're going to be meeting. The guy came, said the meeting was amazing. It just Holy Spirit filled. It was, it was a beautiful meeting, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. It was a very good, strong group. 
Why? Because it had elders watching over the flock. Okay? I mean, you get a shepherd out there in the hills and, and he's got his sheep over here in the pasture and he's got them all and he's protecting them and he's looking out like this and stuff. And he looks and he goes, oh, here comes a furry critter. Okay, go on in. Uh, oh, here comes something else that's a little bit different color. Oh, oh, different furry animals. Go on in. You know, oh, there's there's a animals out that side, outside the gate. I'll just open it up. I'll just leave the gate open. All are welcome. Everybody come on in whenever you want to come in. That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. And again, Christians have to get more brains because the current modern church building trend thing is not ready for persecution. When you can get a Jesuit walk into the thing any Sunday, any day of the week, or any week of the year, I should say it that way, because if Sundays can't be any day of the week, you get a Jesuit walk into the place, nobody would notice. The place could be infiltrated. There are stories of witches infiltrating churches. Just walking right in. Why? Everybody's welcome. It's insanity. Total insanity. But that's okay because we'll be ready. The church building Christians will be ready when persecution comes. I mean, when persecution comes, they're just going to go right over to the house church movement and they'll be doing it expertly. Don't worry. Everything's fine. Nothing to see here. Go to Galatians. Somebody's going, he's going off on the church building thing again. Yes, and I'm going to have to keep preaching against it until people drop their idols. Until the body of Christ finally says, okay, church building's wicked, we're done with them. When you, when you quit it, I'll stop preaching about it, okay? Galatians chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Where did it say that uh, they had heard only that he believed? They had heard only that Saul of Tarsus now has faith in Jesus, and that's it. Paul had a changed life. That's the proof. And you had better get that thing into your thick skull. If you're an easy believes in person, you need to get truly saved because these easy believes in people, you know, they're having a profession of faith so that they can continue in their sin and have no conviction about it. You know, they want to have both. And you better get saved. But if you're, if you're falling for some of this stuff, let me just tell you, the day is going to come very, 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 very soon where Christians are going to have to be real careful who they let into our groups. I mean, think about this. What if nobody said anything bad about Stephen Anderson or Martin Richling or a lot of these other fakers out there? What if nobody ever rebuked them? What if nobody ever said anything about them? You know what they're doing? They are wolves entering into the flock to kill the flock. You know what Stephen Anderson and his little group out and all his little spinoff little clones that are there, you know, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to turn the lost world against us as Bible-believing Christians. I stand up and I say, I believe the King James Bible from cover to cover. And they go, well, you're just like Stephen Anderson and Ken Hovind and, and all these. No, 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 no. Oh, sure you are, sure you are. You know, See, they're trying to turn the world against us. That's what they're trying to do. That's why we have a responsibility to come out and judge them and say, they don't have the changed life that lines up with this scripture right here. Their professions or faith are wrong. Their doctrines are wrong. All this other stuff is bad. They're not in our group. Yeah, we're supposed to preach the gospel to the lost world, but you know what? We have to protect our own as well. We need a bunch of shepherds. We need even the sheep themselves. I mean, imagine a, uh, some wolf come walking in and the shepherd has his back turned and all of a sudden a bunch of sheep just stand up and go, you know, shotguns. What are you doing in here, wolf? No, get, you don't belong in this group. And I thank the Lord that I have some very, very discerning viewers that are able to do that. It's a very, very good thing. That sounds like a shotgun, by the way, if you don't know. Finally, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. This isn't a real huge, big, detailed study because I've been over this thing so much. People just don't want to hear it. Philippians chapter 3. 
Verse 3. Again, we're going to see the thing of a changed life here. It says here, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he must trust, might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, for I, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You mean Paul had to put an end to that, those fleshly desires when he got saved? Things had to change when he got saved? Yeah. He didn't have any confidence in his flesh, you see. He knew, I'm a sinner, I'm wicked, I'm bad, I'm corrupt. He didn't say, well, you know, we're all technically sinners and, and therefore, you know, we all need to be saved and technically and, and you know, and, uh, what about the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? You know, uh-uh. He puts himself down. He says, I'm a sinner. I needed to come to God as a sinner to get saved. He paid for my sins. See? Change. A changed life. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, like the easy believers in people, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. There's a change. When you get genuinely saved, there will be a change in your life. And it's a wonderful change. Like the old hymn says, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. Verse 11, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. See, we're not saying, I'm not saying when you get saved, the changed life gospel doesn't mean you become instantly sinlessly perfect. No, 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 no. It's a thing that you are continually striving for to get rid of these sins. Sanctification. Let's read about it here. Let's continue. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. You see, that's another one of the things that the easy believism heretics will do. They'll say that I'm teaching you have to become sinlessly perfect to prove that you're saved. I've never taught that. Paul doesn't teach that. What we're saying is there's a change that accompanies your salvation where Christians can see there's been a drastic change there. They're not the same person. And you look at that person and you study them. That's why the Bible talks too about that you're not to lay hands suddenly on somebody. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. We're supposed to be careful who we put our hands on in terms of I recommend so-and-so's ministry. We have to be careful about that. Are they preaching the truth? Are they doing things that are according to the scriptures? You know, I personally have made the mistake over the years of laying hands too quickly on people and saying, watch so-and-so's videos, and, I'm, and all later on I'm going, wait, <laughs> you know, I have to take that back. There's a lot of deceivers out there. The Bible-believing Christian church that's all over the world, and it's not some denomination either, by the way, it's just people that believe the, the King James Bible from cover to cover, or whatever's closest in your language, uh, be it the Schlachter or the Reina Valera or the Valera Gomez or whatever the different ones are there in the Spanish language or whatever it is in your language. My point is, those of us that believe the Bible, we have a standard that we can hold in our hands and say, this is what God wants for your life. Okay, That's who falls under, falls under the, the description of Bible-believing Christian. We need to be able to judge and say, 
is that person lining up with this book? All right. Has there been a change in their life? That's there. So we are not preaching. I'm not preaching that you must become sinlessly perfect. Again, that's what Paul is saying. He hasn't already apprehended. He has not gotten to the point where he can say, I'm without sin. All right, I have not gotten to that point. I have not gotten to the point where I can say, I understand the Bible completely, 100%. I never make a mistake. I'm a man, okay? I'm not the standard. The book is the standard. Okay? If you are you know, follow this ministry, you've learned that by now. Um, I had somebody write to me recently, and they said about, I can't think of how he worded it, but it was great, and he said something to the effect of, I'm not really... Um, all that important in the sense of uh, I'm not pointing people to myself, I'm pointing people to the book. That's your standard. Okay, It always will be this as your standard, not me. But I can tell you right now, if you are saved, your life will match that of Paul. There will be a past life that people can look at and say, I remember, you. didn't you used to be such and such? or Didn't you used to say this? Or didn't you used to do that? Now, why don't you anymore? That's there in salvation. People don't say, yeah, I remember the way you used to be. Boy, you never changed. You don't change, do you? I can tell you right now, people that I know from my past, they look at me and they go, what happened to him? You know, I remember we were at the store the one time, Lowe's up in, above us here, north of us, and uh, we're standing there, and my wife and myself and our son, and, and I hear some people back behind us, and they go, what do you think they are? And the other one went, I don't know. <laughs> Whispering, you know, what do you think they are? I don't know. <laughs> you know, because they look at us and they're like, okay, we're not Amish. They don't, you know, we don't look like Amish. We're not Muslim. You know, my wife doesn't wear any kind of a head covering. You know, I'm her head covering. I don't get on her head. So, you know, she doesn't wear a head covering. But, uh, you know, if people are just like, you know, they see us out in public and they're scratching their heads and they're going, what? what? You know, <laughs> And I'm not saying you have to purposefully go out of your way to look, you know, odd or whatever. You just live as a Christian, you'll look odd. And, uh, but you'll see that thing. People, you know, that know you from your past are going to say, what on earth happened to you? Boy, you changed. That's the mark of true conversion. And yes, you're still going to struggle with sin. You're still going to have those hard times where you mess up and you're going to be like, <sighs> you know, I mean, this might shock some of you, but I actually do mess up once in a while. So, <laughs> just once in a while, you know, just, just occasionally, you know. Uh, I haven't messed up in at least 30 seconds now. So, but uh, it just, I get so sick and tired of this stuff, you know. I mean, if people look at the majority of my ministry. I've been preaching, you know, online since November of 2008. You know, sermons and sermons, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of preaching for free, available, and everybody just goes, you're lost. Everything that you've done has been in vain. <laughs> you know, just, what? The whole thing? Because I come out and I say that there's a changed life that accompanies salvation? It's not even logical. It doesn't even make any sense. And again, I've said to these heretics over and over again, I say, okay, what must I do to be saved? And they say, you have to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I say, can I continue teaching, you know, that there has to be a change in your life? They say, no. So I say, okay, so what you're saying is I have to change my life by putting my faith in Jesus Christ, and then I can't preach what I'm pre currently preaching, which would be a changed life. You know, woo, 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 woo. a little gone up here, you know. A few of the gears fell out of the ear or something there. The, the old clock's not working anymore, you know. They can't have the little cuckoo bird come out anymore. I mean, crazy. So, yes, there is a changed life. Paul is our example. He is the one that we are supposed to look to and say, okay, what happened in Paul's life? What are the things that Paul has written to us? The whole Bible is given for instruction in righteousness. You know, the Bible teaches that. But doctrinally, you know, be very careful. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't understand that, you can watch some of my videos on dispensational teaching. Proper division is what makes sense of this book. When you just go, the whole Bible's for me, everything applies to me, you come out extremely confused. You come out just with mental problems, essentially. And that's what, again, a lot of these easy believism people, uh, they're non-dispensational. They'll go back to the Old Testament. They go, 
way past the Pauline epistles. They go, they just, everywhere. That's why they have mental problems. And uh, among other things too. So that's going to be it. Um, just wanted to put this thing together just as a, you know, Lord showed that to me the other day. Just the thing of people, when they heard about Paul's conversion, they wanted to see fruit. They wanted to see change. Has there been a change? Is, is this the same guy that's been persecuting us? Yeah. They were not saying, oh, well, he believes now. Great, let him in. They were saying, eh, we're going to need to see some proof. we got to get back to that, brethren. Uh, back years ago when, when I was a part of Bible Believers Fellowship, uh, we were not open to just anybody that wanted to come. We had to sit down and talk to them. And there were some people we turned away. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was a guy the one time we went and we met with him in a public place, you know, and, and uh, myself and, and brother Jesse Dulesky. And we met with the guy, and I, it wasn't five minutes into talking to the guy, and I was just like, no, 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 no. This guy's messed up in the head, and he doesn't want to be corrected. And turned out he was a hyper-Calvinist and a, a bunch of other really, really, really weird stuff. He was a postie, um, you know, was on drugs and things. I mean, the guy was messed up in the head. Uh, very, very, very bad and very prideful. Did not want to change. So and then there was another guy the one time, and we... Uh, we went and we met with him and we got to talking to him and a wonderful time of fellowship and, and he got involved and, and uh, we did a lot of great work and things uh, and stuff with the guy. I mean, great man. Christians need to do that. We need to, to, to start saying, oh, somebody just professes to be saved. I'm not going to go, oh, okay, cool. You know, No, we need to start to say, well, what do you mean? You know? a lot of false converts out there, brethren. And I'll tell you what, I think the most tragic person going to hell would be somebody who's a false convert. Who's been led to believe that they're a saved Christian and they're not. That's a tragedy. And these ministers of Satan that are going out there and preaching is just, just believe, just believe. Just only believe. No repentance, no anything like that. There's a very special hot place in hell reserved for those false prophets. I'll tell you that right now. So that is going to be it. Please be careful, brethren. Uh, I can't be everywhere and be everybody's savior or something like that in terms of Jesus is your savior. But you say, well, brother, can you fight these battles for me and stuff like this? I can't. I can't do it. Um, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm here to teach. I'm here to preach. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord he's put me into this position and, and things. My wife and I, we both work very hard to bring out videos to edify the body of Christ and, and teach you how to answer people and whatever else we can do. But it comes right down to it. You're going to have to look up some of this stuff for yourself. You're going to have to have that strong personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have never, ever wanted a cult of personality with Denlinger rights or something like this following me. I've never wanted that. Uh, I think that's a terrible, terrible thing. Paul rebuked the Corinthians because they were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm of, you know, Apollos and things like this. Not supposed to be that way. Um, you got to be very careful of that. I mean, I don't know if something could eventually happen to myself, or my wife, or both of us, whatever. Uh, what are you going to be left with? You need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, learn from ministries, sure, absolutely. But when it comes right down to it, you need to have that changed life. And Paul needs to be your example. That's it. Thank you for watching.